All right, well, good morning, everyone. Time for us to start our class this morning. Man, it's a rainy morning. Uh, hopefully, you got uh, in here nice and dry. But uh, let's go ahead and have a word of uh, prayer. Heavenly Father, we enter your presence this morning with, with thanksgiving in our hearts, with, with, with joy in our souls, and just uh, give you our deepest and most sincere praise. We, we do so appreciate the, this time that you have orchestrated the, the, this morning, that you've made possible, where we can set aside so much of life that, that keeps us uh, thinking in wrong directions, threatens to shift our perspectives in, in ways that they shouldn't go and distracts us from the wonderful work that you've given to us and so often the, the joy that, that comes from those things. Now, Heavenly Father, we, we're thankful for this family that meets here to, to reinforce those ideas, to, to build uh, one another up, to encourage and strengthen. We ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, you give each and every one uh, of us uh, gathered this morning that, that mindset to, to consider your word, to to take those things that you have uh, written, to take those things that you have given us for our benefit and uh, truly see them as relevant to our lives, fruitful in their application. And Heavenly Father, uh, just uh, grant us that, uh, that, that fruit in life-changing ways. And Heavenly Father, we, we pray for those of our number who are sick and uh, understand that that uh, list is quite extensive. And yet, we know that you are, you are mighty, not only to save, but to heal. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, just that, uh, that healing you provide, that peace and that hope. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, most of all for your son who went to a cross and died, providing for us that pathway to you. It's in his name we pray. And amen. All right. Well, this morning we continue uh, our discussion of things we left off uh, last week. Uh, spending a couple weeks on what the Bible says uh, about, uh, you know, alcohol and alcohol, you know, consumption and uh, this one. And then uh, I'm going to kind of just give you sort of a forewarning about next week. Uh, hopefully we'll get through all of the material that we designed for this week. Uh, well, this week, uh, next week, uh, and I can make these available. I know Glenn is going to have some for the women in his ladies class. Uh, if you want some, uh, the information, I'd be more than happy to print up. Uh, copies uh, and uh, get it to you but <clears throat> next week we're going to deal a little bit um, and it wasn't planned uh, but the more I thought about it the uh, the more relevant it, it seemed uh, we're going to deal a little bit with uh, drug and drug usage uh, partly because uh, well it's a problem uh, but also because uh, there is a really big push uh, to you know especially legalize certain drugs within uh, our country and a lot of people have questions about um, you know, those, those drugs and uh, what, what they can do, what are the facts. One, uh, one time you're told that, well, you know, it's beneficial and limited to this. Another time it's, uh, you know, not, um, uh, you know, that's not the, what we see practically taking place uh, in the world. So, you know, what is, what is the Christian supposed to think about, uh, you know, the use of um, drugs that in the past were considered illicit, but now uh, have almost become kind of a mainstream, you know, type of thing. Uh, so we're going to examine some of that next week uh, as well. Uh, but this week we're dealing about what does the Bible say about, um, you know, alcohol? What does the Bible say about the consumption uh, of uh, alcohol? And we affirmed a couple of different things. Uh, the video affirmed uh, for us uh, some, uh, some uh, things about uh, social drinking uh, and took uh, a particular stance. And in reality, the, the whole kind of systems of arguments usually fall into one of two categories. Um, <clears throat> typically, you have those on one side who say, well, there's no, there's no real uh, acceptable, uh, acceptable you know, usage uh, of any level uh, of uh, alcohol. In the past, those people have been called teetotalers, uh, total abstinence, uh, you know, proponents, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and essentially, the belief is just that, um, that uh, you know, no consumption of alcohol in any uh, degree or measure uh, is going to be, you know, profitable and uh, is um, more or less outright sinful. Uh, then you have folks on the, the other side who <clears throat> will affirm most of, of what, and, and that's the thing that sometimes we miss. Uh, most pe people affirm uh, kind of the same things. 90 to 95 percent of the arguments that are made 
um, concerning what the Bible says about, you know, alcohol uh, are typically shared uh, beliefs. Uh, they're typically shared beliefs. Um, it's just uh, we deviate, uh, so to speak, on uh, this, uh, and now we've called it social drinking, um, but different people in different generations have called it uh, different things. Um, the folks on the, the side that, that advocate that, they, they don't call it typically social drinking. Uh, what, what they'll call it is drinking in moderation. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the argument that they typically make. Uh, so, you know, we have those, those two sides uh, of this uh, argument. Uh, and when it comes right down to it, uh, it's, of course, up to each and every one of us to study these matters uh, and to, uh, you know, make uh, our decision based on what the Bible says uh, rather than, uh, you know, experience, background, so on and so forth. Uh, and that's vital, uh, especially in, you know, <clears throat> an issue like this one, uh, because there's so much experience that, that people have. Uh, there's so, you know, many experiences that, that folks have and they carry and they bring into the issue um, that uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to get really right down to sort of brass tacks and what the Bible actually says uh, about this particular, you know, issue. Um, instead, we, we kind of uh, at times turn it into an anecdotal debate. Um, and, and, you know, everybody's got a story uh, and everybody's got, uh, you, you know, a, a statistic and everybody's got, you know, that. And all oh, that's great and I'm not picking on that at all, but that's not Bible. Uh, what does the Bible say? Uh, so we need to wash away, kind of, you know, clear the vision, so to speak, uh, of all of the, you know, quote, anecdotal evidence and, and examine just very simply what does the scripture say uh, about uh, the use of, you know, alcohol? Well, we know what the world affirms. Uh, we know on one hand, uh, there's a whole mass uh, of information and statistics and uh, scientific research that tells us things like alcohol is a poison. Uh, it is a toxin, um, and uh, it, it is not um, you know, designed to be taken into the body in large quantities because it will kill you. Uh, it will kill you. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that. The science is uh, undebatable, uh, and we see it over and over uh, each and you know, every year. Um, <clears throat> there are plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, studies that are done about what uh, alcohol does uh, to the body. Uh, and how it affects, uh, you know, the nervous system and our ability to function and those, uh, you know, fine motor skills. And then, you know, those major, you know, motor skills uh, as we drink more and more. Most of that's been fairly well uh, established. Uh, and most of that goes along with uh, what we constantly affirm, you know, from the Bible. Uh, that uh, drunkenness is, is something that God condemns. Uh, and we can see from the scientific research why that is. Uh, there's this idea within Scripture uh, as a whole uh, that is very simply, uh, very simply uh, called, well, to use the, uh, the non-technical term, self-control. Uh, how many times uh, are we told in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, uh, that we as children of God or, or we as human beings must, you know, exercise self-control? Temperance is another way of putting it. I mean, over and over, right? I mean, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, correct? You know, self-control uh, is uh, one of those uh, fruits that we bear when the Spirit of God uh, is w within us. Uh, so we ought to have that, you know, self-control. Well, drunkenness uh, is very simply the opposite uh, of that. Uh, it's the opposite of that. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, at least in that realm, this basic idea uh, that... Um, that uh, alcohol doesn't harmonize um, with uh, what God has intended, you know, for each uh, and every one of us. But we want to go and we want to look at um, a couple of different things. Uh, and uh, again, if you have questions, comments uh, that you want to, to make, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, Try to give a good sampling in the videos and in the notes uh, in the book uh, of kind of both sides of the issue. Uh, the first fellow we saw in the video uh, made some arguments that, <clears throat> you know, were pretty strong uh, ag against any type uh, of alcohol consumption. Um, the notes that uh, were in the book, if, if you read through them, uh, weren't exactly the opposite, uh, but uh, they did have sections in there 
uh, that affirm that, you know, a, a moderate use uh, of, um, you know, alcohol uh, would be the proper uh, take on what the scripture says. Uh, so, you know, if anybody has any questions regarding the notes or, or the video, um, feel free to throw them out. Uh, feel free to, you, you know, uh, disagree uh, because these are guys, right? Uh, some, some fellow wrote those notes uh, and uh, some, of course, you know, the guy is, you know, he's just a man like you, you and I. Uh, when <clears throat> it comes right down to it, excuse me, we want to know what the Bible says. Uh, and it's possible for us to, uh, to make mistakes, uh, to make mistakes. Um, but let's go and look at what the, the Bible has to say. Last week we kind of started looking at wine uh, just a little bit, and we looked at the, the usage in the Old Testament and how sometimes it refers to that fermented beverage, sometimes it refers to um, grapes as they're still growing uh, on the, you know, the vine, on the vine. Um, typically when, uh, when um, they want to refer to what we would call grape juice, uh, they'll talk about new wine, uh, new wine. Um, and um, anybody who grows uh, any kind of grape will, will tell you. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, I, I never really quite understood um, uh, why people use the whole grape in the cluster thing as, as an argument. Um, be, because if you've ever grown grapes, anybody ever grow grapes? No? We had them when I was a kid. We had them when I was a kid, and we'd go out there, and we, we had Concord grapes. Uh, this kind we had, and man, they were delicious. Uh, just, I couldn't stand the seeds, but I really liked the grapes. Uh, but, but anybody who's ever grown grapes will tell you uh, that, um, you know, when those grapes, if you let them hang on the vine, uh, if you let them stay there, they will actually start to ferment hanging on the vine. Uh, as a kid... <laughs> you go out there and you're picking them right off and you're popping them in your mouth uh, and they start to taste really funny uh, and uh, you, you, know, you quit eating them because they, mm, they taste weird. Um, but that does happen. Uh, it does happen. Uh, so those passages aren't necessarily as, as clear as we would like to, to think. So typically when the Bible refers to what we would call grape juice, uh, it, it uses the term new wine. Uh, new wine, uh, wine that, that has been freshly pressed uh, in its season, uh, and it would have been at its highest, you know, quality. Uh, for them, you know, fermentation was, uh, and um, I guess maybe we're not around this enough um, to experience it. Um, have you ever fermented anything? How hard is it to ferment something? It's not real hard, is it? No, uh, I mean, we, uh, everybody... I'll probably, I'll, Glenn's done it. Fer fermented fruit? <laughs> All right. Right, right, I know. And a lot of people cook with, with alcohols uh, and, um, you know, create fine dishes. But that's kind of a little different thing, you, you know. But um, fermentation is not a really difficult process. Uh, we, uh, now, nobody else in my house will eat it. Uh, but uh, you know what kimchi is? Kimchi? Kimchi is like, a, it's like an Asian cabbage. Uh, and you take a whole bunch of salt, and you take a whole bunch of red peppers, and you put it in there with some vinegar, and you cover it, uh, and you put something real heavy on top of it, and you let it sit, uh, and it literally ferments. It ferments. It's a Korean, you know, it's a Korean type of food. We, we've done that at home. Nobody, nobody eats it except for me. <laughs> right. Right, yeah, it's sourdough is another, another one. You know, it's, uh, when you have that starter, that's, that's fermented. Uh, and, but the thing that, you know, if you've never done it, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's hard to understand that, um, you know, fermentation well, not only, you know, kind of happens as sort of a natural process of things, uh, but it represents the, the breakdown uh, of things. You know, it's um, essentially the, the breakdown and the production of gases. Uh, if you've ever fermented something, you realize that 
um, you know, that happens. You know, you remember the Christ when he was talking about, you know, putting new wine in old wineskins? Well, that's part of what he was talking about. You know, when something ferments, it, it creates this, this gas. Uh, it creates a gas. Uh, and um, it'll simply burst those wineskins. Um, you know, so, I mean, fermentation is something that <clears throat> it, it does happen naturally, but it is... Uh, it does constitute the, the breakdown of, of something. Uh, and you can, you can speed it along by using certain things, for instance, yeast uh, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, or adding yeast you know, to something that's already um, breaking, breaking down uh, will actually you know, speed the, the process. Uh, and that's why, you know, and this kind of plays into a number of ideas throughout the Bible. You know, for instance, uh, why unleavened bread? You know, why unleavened bread in those, you know, ancient feasts? Uh, and then, of course, even up to, you know, the Lord's, you know, supper. Uh, and, um, y- you know, well, it's because uh, leaven represented that beginning of that fermentation process, the breakdown uh, of something, or to maybe put it in a little different way, the putrefaction uh, of something, something becoming putrid uh, or, you know, rotten, essentially. Now, we, we can control that. Uh, and we can kind of manipulate that uh, in our, you know, modern day uh, and make some pretty tasty, you know, things uh, because of it. Uh, but uh, it, it still represents a, a breakdown of uh, the original sub- substance. And God wanted, especially in those ancient feasts, you know, purity. Uh, he wanted purity. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, folks who kind of argue for the, uh, the, the fermented wine on um, the Passover really just don't understand too much about the ancient history uh, of the Jews because that would have not been allowed. Uh, I mean, they were to literally search their homes uh, for, you know, yeast and things like that and get it out of their house uh, only to go and drink fermented wine for the Passover. That doesn't make much sense. Uh, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, so, you know, they, uh, uh, you know they, they basically set those things aside uh, because it was uh, the putrefaction uh, of something. Uh, but um, again, that just goes back to the, to the point where uh, we find new wine uh, being used, uh, and it would typically refer to, typically refer to um, that uh, grape juice, as we would you know, call it, as we would call it. Um, there are passages in the Old Testament, passages in the New Testament. We've already pointed out that uh, those in the New Testament are determined, or at least their meaning, um, the word oinos, uh, is determined by context, uh, by context. Now, that means we've got to work. Uh, you know, that, that means we've got to read. We've got to get the immediate context. We've got to get the remote context. We've got to fit it into the overall picture uh, of the Scripture uh, in order to determine, you know, what is the meaning uh, of this particular word, you know, as it's used. Uh, you, you know, folks who have argued, for instance, that, you know, the Lord's Supper was, um, <clears throat> you know, fruit of the vine, and that's very generic, uh, and therefore can be, you know, either. Um, seems to me they forget all about, you know, the, the Passover uh, and what it was all about, uh, and the fact that, you know, that type of thing would not be allowed, uh, would not be allowed. Uh, I mean, God is constantly telling them, you know, for these feasts, we want the first and the best, the first and the best, the pure. Uh, and um, it would not have been acceptable uh, to those Jewish folks. Uh, and, um, you know, that's the example uh, that we have. So you have to take these pieces from the New Testament and you have to fit them into uh, that larger view, uh, that larger view of, you know, Scripture, larger view of Scripture. Um, for some reason, uh, a lot of folks want to go to, you know, Christ turning the water to, to wine. Uh, and I don't, I don't know why that's become the epicenter. I, I guess maybe because it was, uh, you know, Jesus um, who, who made it. And we think that somehow him making, you know, one or the other is a refutation or um, uh, an advocacy uh, of, uh, you know, either drinking or, or not drinking. 
Uh, quite frankly, when we go to that context and we argue from either one, we're kind of missing the whole point uh, of the story. I mean, the story, <laughs> the story really isn't about, uh, isn't, isn't about uh, you know, wine fermented or not. Uh, that, that's, not that's not the overt teaching. Uh, the teaching is just about you know, the, the power uh, that, that he possessed and the ability uh, that uh, he had. But, you know, uh, for him to have made, you know, fermented wine in about 180 gallons uh, is what it would have been, uh, and pass that out after the people who have already had uh, consumed some, would violate other passages of Scripture. Uh, it would be a violation of, you know, for instance, uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, um, verse 15. I know some folks have hand up, so I'll get them right after we read uh, this passage. Uh, but if you go back to Habakkuk, <clears throat> In chapter 2, um, and verse 15, and of course you can read kind of similar things in the New Testament uh, as well. Uh, but it says, uh, For the earth will be filled with knowledge of the glory of the Lord, verse 14, as the waters cover the sea, woe to him who makes his neighbors drink, to pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze upon um, their you know, nakedness. I mean, you, you can't make wine and give it to other people, uh, get them drunk, and not be responsible uh, for that. Uh, is what Habakkuk is telling us. Uh, but if you, you know, if you don't like what Habakkuk said about it, uh, just go forward uh, just a little bit in, in your Bibles to the book of Luke. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. It says, but uh, beginning in verse 45, it says, But if the servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, he begins to beat the male servants and female servants and to eat and to drink and to get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him uh, with uh, the unfaithful. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, again, uh, speaks, speaks of uh, drunkenness and, and how it's you know, wrong. Uh, so, you know, Christ isn't making, you know, just a little bit of wine here. Uh, I mean, when he did miraculous things, he did them in a very big way. We're not talking about, you know, a single, you know, bottle of wine that some people would have gotten to drink a little bit from and everybody else would have just got to sniff the empty bottle. Uh, we're talking about 180 gallons uh, of wine. You know, and, you know, they give us, they give us the measurements. Uh, they tell us, you know, about the water and how much there was. Uh, and if you turn that all into, uh, you know, uh, fermented, uh, you know, beverage, uh, then, yeah, you know, he's passing it out so these people can get drunk. And that doesn't harmonize with the rest of Scripture. So, again, not a good place to argue that point from. Uh, and it um, doesn't fit with the rest uh, of the tone of Scripture, does it? Surely. Sure. No, no, no. That that that's right. He used he takes something from the physical world um, that everybody would acknowledge as true. This is something you don't do. It's not appropriate. Uh, well, why? Well, because it's going to burst the wine skin. Um, so most people would have understood because of the way they had to keep and preserve things. Most people would have understood that. Uh, but you're right, the, the eventual application is just that. Uh, that, you know, there's, uh, there's the new and there's the old, and it's not appropriate uh, to, you know, <clears throat> hang on to that old uh, and, and not uh, embrace that, that new as far as the kingdom and the teaching goes. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the message, that's the point. Um, you know, but he uses something from the real world that they would have understood. Stood. And... and you know, what he says about the skins themselves is true, uh, is accurate. Uh, if it wasn't true and accurate, then the metaphor doesn't make much sense. You know what I mean? But yeah, you're right. The, the, that is the teaching. That is the teaching.
Right. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. He does that a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, every parable is like that. Uh, you know, uh, truly, when I was a kid, you know, they told us that parables are uh, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Uh, so, you know, on the, even on the surface of it, uh, there's that dual kind of role. You, you can see these things in real life taking place uh, and say, yeah, that, that's the way it is. Uh, but then when it comes to the actual meaning behind it, you're like, yeah, that's just as true as that is, you, you know, easy to understand. Okay, very good. Someone else had their hand up. Joyce, was it you? No? All right, anyone else? Well, it's uh, interesting. It's a good point to bring up. Uh, but the word for drunkenness, it's, it's not the same word. Um, if you, what? Okay. I mean, it's not. I, I didn't write the words. You know, I mean, they're God's words. They're not mine. But it's not the same word. Um, the word uh, in the context of the Cana wedding feast uh, is not the word that we typically see in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 12, uh, that is drunkenness. Um, the, word, <clears throat> uh, the word that uh, is used there, it just simply refers to um, freely drinking. You, you know, I mean, it, it, would, it, it doesn't, it, maybe the best way to put it is, it doesn't include the word, it doesn't inhere the word alcohol. Does that make sense? I mean, this word is used for people who are drinking water. This word would be used for people who are drinking anything. It just means that, well, you know, the camels were really thirsty, and they came to the well, and they drank freely. They drank freely. Uh, that's the word that's being used. It's not the word that's typically used uh, for being drunk. Okay, so so it's, a, it's a different word. Um, and, and, you know, most people, <clears throat> when they figure out the difference between the words... Um, interpret the context a little differently. Uh, essentially what the, the governor of the feast is saying is that now that people have already had their fill, you know, you're bringing out the good stuff. You know, I mean, usually you set out the best first. Um, but, you know, the idea of alcohol is not there inherently because the word that is used is not including it. Does that make sense? Glenn. Glenn. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and that, that's a good way to put it. Uh, it's not the English word that's different. Uh, and you will find the English, you know, renditions different. It's the original word. Uh, it's the words <clears throat> in the original language uh, that are being used. Uh, and the word that is used uh, at the, the wedding feast is not a word that, by definition, includes the consumption of alcohol. Okay? Some words um, throughout Scripture <clears throat> have to include certain ideas. You know, for instance, baptism or baptizo, um, it, it literally means to immerse uh, in water. And it includes the idea, uh, it includes the idea of the water in the word, right? Uh, and um, it's used metaphorically at times uh, to be compassed about. But, uh, you know, there are other words that don't. There are words, for instance, for washing uh, that don't necessarily include uh, the idea. Does that make any sense? Right, the idea of immersion. Okay, but the word that's used here uh, does not necessarily mean they were, you know, does not mean um, 
or does not have to mean that they were consuming alcohol. You know what I mean? I mean, if you go home and you have three glasses of water, would you say you drank water freely? Sure. Sure. If you went home and made yourself a big old pitcher of Kool-Aid and down that all, what, did you drink freely? Sure. Well, that's the word that's being used. It's just a generic word for drinking. Okay, for drinking. It's not <clears throat> drinking. Now, we use that word today. I mean, if you walked up to... <clears throat> If you walked up to, you know, Glenn or me or anybody else here after services, and you said, do you drink? We would know what they were talking about because that's the way we use the word. Uh, we use the word to mean or to inherently include the idea of alcohol. Um, the word that's being used here does not include that in the idea. It's just generic. Okay. So it doesn't have to mean that, well, after they were all drunk. It doesn't have to mean that. Now, if they were drinking alcohol, then yes, that's what it would mean. But you have to get the alcohol from some other place in the context. You can't get it from that word, because it's not there. You have to get it from the overall context. Okay? Glenn. <clears throat> Right. Yeah, and that's typically the case, right? You know, I mean, there's no, in other words, there's nothing in the context that tells us, um, aside from our misassumptions about that particular word, uh, you know, which, see, that, that's a problem with, that we sometimes do with Bible interpretation. We, we, we take, and that's the difficulty with translation. Um, we don't always capture the full idea of the original words. Uh, and I'm not picking on scholars that do that. They're, I mean, they're a lot smarter than I am. Uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult sometimes to take an idea from one language and culture and apply it to another language and culture, uh, especially when <clears throat> that language is English and it's a living language and the words are constantly uh, you know, changing uh, definition or adding nuance. Uh, to definition. For us, drinking, every time we see that, especially when it comes to wedding or party, we automatically think alcohol. You know, we automatically do. But that doesn't necessarily play out in, in the first century. You know, they had plenty of gatherings where, you know, they were drinking, but there's no alcohol. You don't agree, Jeannie? Well, it's not a matter of, <clears throat> look, it, look, it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. It's just simply a matter of owning a dictionary. Okay, and when's the last time you were at a first century wedding? Yeah, it, it's my point exactly. I mean, we're not there. I mean, how many of us speak fluent Greek? I don't. I just, you know, I study it. And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to us taking a modern definition in the English language and applying it to a word and a context that was written 2,000 years ago. We can't make that mistake. I mean, that is, <clears throat> uh, no matter what you do, you can't make that mistake. I don't care if we're talking about, you know, baptism or love or forgiveness or whatever. You can't go to a context and force a modern uh, meaning or begin with the modern meaning or definition of a word uh, and apply that to scripture. It just doesn't work. But, and then Glenn, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat>
Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we were very fortunate that it was not at the time that the service was turning out because the front doors used to open out right into the front. Several people could have been entered back. Very true, very true. <clears throat> and many people have. Glenn and then Shirley. Just in our lifetime, <clears throat> a word as simple as gay has changed meanings so much. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and if you go back and you read literature that's, you know, not been, you know, that was produced 50, even 50 years ago, you'll find that word being used and, you know, they just simply using it differently, happy, you know, happy and, you know, festive, Yeah. Shirley and the Sam, and then I'll, we'll get you in. I promise. Um, this is very interesting. <clears throat> I hadn't thought that way about the drunkenness before. Could could you use the word correctly and say that it's overdoing? Like you mentioned, drunk with too much water. You know, drinking too much. You get drunk there. Can you say drunk with food? You said well. Well, I mean, the word, I mean, that would be, uh, you, you know, that would be a different word, typically. Um, you know, that would be the word for, <clears throat> oh, come on. <clears throat> uh, it would probably be a different word that would inherit the, you know, word for food. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I, I don't know, Shirley. I, I wish I could tell you, but I, I really, I, I really don't know if it could be used that way. But, you know, it just simply means to drink something. Now, can it be used, again, don't get me wrong, can it be used for <clears throat> um, drinking alcohol and therefore drunkenness? Yes, it can be. It can be. But that is not inherent in the word. You know, we don't use the word the same way. It could mean, you know, drinking water. It could mean drinking Kool-Aid. It could mean drinking juice. It could mean... <clears throat> Anything. Okay, the word is just generic in its usage. It's kind of like the word for wine itself. It's just generic. It can mean a lot of things. It can mean a lot of things, and context has to determine it. So, really, the biggest question is what from the context tells us uh, that these people are drunk and looking to get more drunk based on the wine that Christ made them? Um, <clears throat> that's the real question. Uh, that you have to ask about the context. Okay. Sam. I've heard this debate go on for a long, well, almost all my, all my life. Yeah, me too. And Christians, each one of us, that we're going to choose which path we, we want to go down. And to, just to me, for myself, whenever I became a voluntarily put on the name of Christ and Christ's life or Christian. And if I do anything to disgrace that name or even give the appearance of disgracing that name, <coughs> shame on me. Uh, yeah. And, and so as, as we battle this out inside, because people have a tendency to talk one way when the, where you're in one group Let us be honest with ourselves. Let, let us choose to be a shining example, not, not to walk in a path of those of the fathers. Don't be influenced by social pressures uh, to drink. Uh, let us honor that name of, of Christian and be Christ-like, rather than know uh, if anything is shadowy, anything that looks like right. it's better than what Sure. So let us all honor the name of Christ. Okay, very good. Yeah. I, just an observation. I came in at the end here, but I'm 
Sure. You're talking about the miracle of Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Right. Right. And back then it was medicinal in some instances uh, to give people wine if they were in a deathbed or maybe mixed with something else back then if they were ill or whatnot. But I think also we can look at God gives us all kinds of things. If we tend to take them and use them in excess, if it's food, whatever. I mean, we could just go through the list. Right. Wine's just one of them. You know, <clears throat> Jesus even condemns that generation of excess. He calls us out in the Bible. Right. <clears throat> right, and that's kind of what I meant when I said you got to fit it in the overall context of Scripture. You know, I mean, you can't take one passage that's really not even teaching about alcohol. I mean, that's not the main point, you know, you know um, and create a whole set of doctrine by which you, you live. Uh, you know, it just... It, it doesn't make much sense to do it that way, and partly for the reason that Sam, you know, mentioned too. But uh, in, the, in the minutes that, that we have left, and unless somebody else has something, um, we do want to speak to the, to the medicinal portion. Now, we noticed on the video in the first time that he, he does mention medicinal things kind of as a side note, uh, but in doing so kind of undermines his whole argument. Um, you know, so... That's not exactly correct. I mean, the old saying is true. You, you know, the argument, argument that proves too much proves nothing at all. Uh, I mean, if we're, if, we're, <laughs> if we're very radical in our argumentation, uh, then we're typically going to end up undermining ourselves. We, we hamstring ourselves. Um, but, you know, the same is true uh, on both sides. Um, the, the Bible clearly tells us uh, that there's a medicinal usage for what we would call alcohol. Uh, they were to, you know, give it to folks who were, were dying, as was pointed out. They were to give it to folks who were in sore distress. Um, now, is that the same as dying? Uh, you'd have to go back and kind of research it a little bit. It seems to be kind of separate uh, from that. So what exactly does that mean? Um, well, uh, you know, I think sore distress is just kind of what it sounds like. Uh, we know that Paul uh, told Timothy to, you know, take a little wine for stomach's sake. Um, you know, for, yeah, for your stomach's sake and your many infirmities. Uh, uses uh, an actual medical term uh, there. Uh, so we do find a, a medicinal usage, which should tell us uh, that this is something that, <clears throat> you know, God uh, is taking. God placed uh, within this world, and there is a use for it. Uh, and there is a use that is a blessed use uh, for it. Uh, and um, just like those other areas, we have a tendency to abuse that idea. Uh, and, um, you know, have it in excess. You know, now, <clears throat> you know, exactly what does medicinal mean? Exactly, you know, how we apply that definition, well, you know, that's, that's going to be between you and God. You know, I mean, your many infirmities, your stomach's sake, your sore distress, you know, all of that, um, those are terms that, you know, have uh, some, <clears throat> uh, you know, meaning, of course, within the scripture uh, to particular, you know, scenarios. Uh, but, you know, does your scenario match that? Do you, would you be justified in doing that? Well, you know, that's, that's you know, that's going to be, you know, for you uh, to kind of consider uh, and to look at. Uh, but, you know, the only other passage that really I wanted to cover, uh, and I don't know that we'll have time to get to it, <clears throat> is found in the notes uh, in the book, the study guide. Uh, but you can go back to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 14 uh, and verse 26, uh, and you can, 
<coughs> you can look at it. Uh, you can look at it, but uh, I'm just going to read it very quickly. Uh, and we can talk about it uh, next time because I don't think we'll have time. He says, and thou, sh <coughs> thou shalt bestow the money. And he's talking about going to the feasts. Uh, they would have to make these long treks uh, every year, no matter where they were, and go back to Jerusalem in order to attend uh, these feasts. And God comes along and he tells them, look, rather than, you know, rather than take, um, you know, all of your, your crops and your, your animals and those things you're going to offer, I am walk them all the way down here at the threat of spoilage or damage or something like that. Uh, you can do this. And he says, and thou shalt bestow the money, well, sell them, uh, sell those things, make the money. And then it says, and thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever your soul lusteth after, for oxen and for sheep and for wine and for strong drink and for whosoever or whatsoever uh, your soul desires. And thou shalt eat uh, there, <clears throat> there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. Now, that's Deuteronomy chapter 14, 26. Uh, and again, a lot of folks go there and they kind of, you know, make a lot of hay uh, about that particular passage saying, well, see, you know, he tells them. He's actually commanding them to, to you know, go and to drink and partake of those things. Well, you know, what do you think? Well, quite frankly, he's talking about a feast that we don't celebrate a anymore. We don't have to make annual treks to Jerusalem because we're not under that system of law. And even if God did require that, uh, he's describing something that is done in his presence. Okay? He's talking about something that's done in his presence, uh, and it's done for a couple of very specific reasons. Okay? Number one, uh, well, for the intent of whatever feast it was, uh, you know, which is going to include calling them to remember. But certainly at the forefront of that uh, is making offering to God and giving him praise um, that he deserves. Uh, and I guess secondary to that idea uh, was that it was a, a feast. It was a celebration uh, of God uh, and, um, you know, the things that he had provided, you know, for them. And again, that would be dictated kind of by what feast that they're actually talking about. Uh, but given the fact that it's a religious celebration, uh, I doubt very seriously that he's talking about, hey, go buy your strong drink and your, your wine and get drunk before the feast. Uh, you can go back to the law and you can, <laughs> you can see that, those direct commands that tell you you're not supposed to do that. You know, don't come into the temple all drunk. You know, don't, don't, you know, this or that and drink and, you know, I mean, obviously that's not the case here. Um, but it is something that was, you know, part of a, a, a worship to God. So it could very well be that, uh, you know, what he's talking about here uh, is, uh, you know, part of the uh, actual offerings that were being made. There were drink offerings. Um, there were offerings that were poured out on the altar. Uh, Paul himself would uh, use that as kind of a metaphor for his life. You know, even though I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Um, you know, Jose? Yes. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that and that's the gist of it. You know, the gist of it is it's it, it is wrong. It is sinful to get drunk. It, it is uh, you know, uh, has been, always will be. Uh, we are to call to let our moderation be known uh, among mankind uh, and uh, to be uh, in self-control. Uh, and we have to let those principles kind of guide uh, the discussion. Okay. I guess we're done. I appreciate everybody's input. I appreciate everybody's questions. If you would, you can turn over to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> 
In just a minute or so, we're going to go and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 1. I want to begin this morning, however, by reading you the words of a, of a song. Before we read those words to that song, which are found in our songbook, I want to share with you just a little bit uh, of kind of a background story, so to speak. Most of us probably have those songs, those places, those people that when we look at them, when we hear them, when we experience them, they remind us of something else. They touch us in some way. And sometimes that's a very, very positive thing, but sometimes that's not always a positive thing, at least on the surface of it all. See, there are things in this world, even down to, you could say, the, the smell or the taste of things, that will impact us deeply and kind of imprint on our hearts certain ideas or, or memories. And the song that we're about to read is one of those songs for me. For the longest time, if I even turned past this song in the songbook, it was an emotional experience, and that might sound weird, but there's a good reason why. See, the song very simply says this, number 777. Father, hear this prayer we offer, nor for ease that prayer shall be but for strength that we may ever live our lives courageously. Not forever by still water would we idly quiet stay, but would smite the living fountains from the rocks along our way. And the final two verses are the verses that always kind of get me. It says, be our strength in hours of weakness. In our wanderings be our guide. Through endeavors, failures, dangers, Father, be there at our side. Let our path be bright or dreary, storm or sunshine be our share. May our souls in hope unweary make the work, thy work, our ceaseless prayer. It's a beautiful song. And I love the song dearly. But again, it's one of those things that kind of reminds me of a dark spot in my life. Because I think we all have those dark spots. There are probably things that remind us of those times when, when we're not exactly at our best. Or maybe the situation around us is not exactly at its best. Or for one reason or another, our thoughts kind of gravitate toward those things that cause us to experience once more heartache and pain that are often associated with them. And yet if life teaches us anything, it's taught us. If God's word teaches us anything, it teaches us that no matter how dark things become, no matter how much the mind itself will torment us and take us back to those places where we would long to forget the things attached And yet, not forget the things that are attached. As we struggle in those places and as we find that trial and experience its bitter sweetness, it is the light of God's word. It is the graciousness of God's gospel that shines ever more brightly. It's from the depths of that despair it's from that time of trial that we can fully come to grips with exactly what it means to receive good news. Have you ever received good news in a worldly sense? Think back to one of those times, just for a minute. If you have to close your eyes, feel free to do so. But think back to one of those times where you received that good news. How did you feel? Where were you at the time? What was your circumstance? What was your situation? What did you do when you received that good news? Maybe the good news was that finally you were going to get a break from the troubles that have come. Maybe the good news was the good news was that some long sought after goal was finally going to become reality. 
Most of us have received some good news. Sometimes we look at the world around us and we wonder if there is such a thing anymore as good news. And yet we know there is. But you see, for all of that good news that we can receive in a worldly way, for all of those windfalls, for all of those goals met, for all of those overcoming of struggles in our existence here, there is no match in any of them for the good news that is what we more commonly know as the gospel. There is no greater news than that which Paul starts with and talks about for an entire book. We simply refer to as the gospel. Turn over to Romans with me. If you're not there already, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I want us to begin reading at verse 1. Paul writes and he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, much like the good news itself, these are words that when we typically read them, we just kind of go right past them because we see them as sort of the introduction to the book. And we want to get on to kind of the meat and discussing what Paul actually has to say or some of those favorite passages. Sometimes we skip right over this and we want to get down to that passage that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, right? That's a little bit later in the chapter. But we do so to our own detriment because it's in these verses that Paul kind of sets the tone for the entirety of the book. You've got to remember that Paul is not a guy who, who cannot relate to the idea of being in dark places. And when you say dark places, you interpret that however you want. But Paul is familiar with what it means to be tormented and tried. Not just externally. See, later on in, in chapter 7, we're going to realize that part of Paul's term, torment took place inside of Paul. He says there was this constant battle and this constant struggle that goes on. The waging of war between what his flesh wanted and what his spirit wanted. Paul knew what it was to be in those places. But he knew that the answer for it all was the gospel. He knew that the cure for those places was the good news. You see, we look at the world around us and we don't see that good news, but in reality... The only really, truly good and lasting news that we can receive has come from God himself. Go throughout scripture and you find this to be true, just kind of as a, uh, an overview. Go back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, and I'm going to try to go through these pretty quickly. It says, and that in, the, in the same region there were shepherds in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that, with, <clears throat> that will be for all the people. And unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Skip forward to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Go forward three chapters to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip, when they believed Philip as he had preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Go forward to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And we're going to look at verse 18. 
Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And you can go on and on, and you can list all of the passages that deal with the gospel and the teaching of the gospel, and what you find out, or what sometimes sort of escapes our attention, is that there is good news. See, those dark positions that sometimes we we get in, those trials and the overcoming of those trials, the practical reality of our life each and every day has an answer. And it's found in that one simple word, the gospel. But I want us to notice something about what Paul says about the gospel in Romans chapter 1 beginning with verse 1. There are a couple of different things. matter of fact, there are three things that I want to bring up. Number one, he says that this is the gospel of the apostles. The gospel of the apostles. Now, when he says this, of course, Paul is using the word apostle here in a very technical tense. He says that I am an apostle. I am an apostle. He's also a bondservant, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, Paul actually speaks a little redundantly here, because apostle literally means set apart. It means set apart. It also means one who is sent, but it literally means to be set apart. So Paul here kind of repeats himself. I'm an apostle, and in case you don't understand that, I'm set apart for the purpose of the gospel. Now, the thing that just kind of hit me the other day when I was reading through this section of Scripture is that, you know, how, many, how much of your life do you spend contemplating exactly what you're supposed to be doing and who you're supposed to be and what your purpose is in life? Have you ever wondered about that? You're wondering about that? Maybe when you're younger you ask that question a little bit more, but maybe even uh, up until our later years we're asking that. You know, why am I here? I mean, what, what, what could, do I have to do? Maybe it's more about what do I have left to do? We spend a lot of time kind of contemplating that, but you notice that, that Paul doesn't even get near those questions. Paul, with great clarity, says, this is my purpose in life. My entire life, now think about that for a minute. My entire life as the bondservant, literally the slave of Christ, is to do this one thing. I've been set apart for this one purpose. Paul was given that direction by God. I want you to turn over with me. Keep your place there in Romans. But turn over, <clears throat> turn over with me to the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And I want to read just verses uh, 1 through 10. It's a very quick read. <clears throat> and he called to, him, uh, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The name of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Galilees and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you can continue kind of reading the rest uh, on your own. But he sets them apart and then he sends them out. And in a very technical sense, they had a specific job. You see, the gospel, the gospel, this, this powerful force that sometimes we... we kind of play fast and loose with. This good news of God. God had prepared for it. He sent Christ to train the twelve. And in those twelve, he placed this power. Now notice what it says they could do. Gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. And we don't live in that age anymore. The age of the miraculous, as Paul himself would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is gone. It's, it's done away with. The, the miracles and all of those things of the first century were just kind of a scaffolding for the church and the building of that early church. And those things are, are not part of our current spiritual reality. 
That doesn't mean God doesn't work, and it certainly doesn't mean that we're not spiritually gifted. God does work. God's good news is, is still His good news, and He still calls us to be ministers of that good news. You see, the word apostle is not just limited to this particular office. See, you and I, in a very real sense today, are called to be set apart. We're called, and then God sends us out. See, the gospel is that powerful. The gospel is that important that he created these men, these foundational figures who would teach and who would build and who would form that early church, brought them together, imparted to them spiritual gifts that would create generation after generation after generation of people who were willing to set apart their lives for the purpose of being sent out for the sake of the gospel. So while we don't wear name tags that say apostles or appoint them, because that's God's job and that time is past, God does send and God does set apart. Where is he sending us? But I want you to notice something else that Paul says in Romans. Romans chapter 1, this time in, in verse 2. You notice that he says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. See, the gospel is not just the gospel of the apostles. He said it's also the gospel of the prophets. Now, the prophets had a couple of different roles. If you go back and you look at what they did, most of the time, we think, see, we think prophet, we think people who foretell, people who kind of look to the future and say, this is going to happen. Of those prophets that wrote, much of their writing, as a matter of fact, I would dare say the bulk of their writing didn't really involve that. Now, there are over 350 prophecies concerning Christ alone and and what would happen in in the course of his birth, his life, his death, and and so on. And there are a lot of this, a lot of these foretelling types of things going on in the Old Testament. But the bulk of what the prophets wrote about was what you would call forthtelling. In other words, they came along and they saw someone out of harmony with God's word and they said, you shouldn't do that. And, and if you do do that, God's already revealed to us through many, 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 many years of history that this is what's going to happen. But if you repent and change your ways, then God has told us through many, many, many years of history that this is what's going to happen. So much of their time was just very simply spent in telling people the reality of things. This is what God has said. This is what God expects. Now, was it possible for someone to pervert that? Well, sure, there are false prophets all over the place in the Scripture. But God even gives a test to to tell whether or not that prophet was true. If you go back to Deuteronomy in chapter 18. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, <clears throat> beginning with verse 21, Moses wrote, And if you say in your heart, How may we know the word that the Lord how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. And the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. People wanted to know, hey, is what this guy saying true? I mean, just how good is this good news? I want you to kind of think about this for just a minute. God, long before the time even of those apostles, gives these messages to these prophets who in the course of their foretelling talk all about Jesus Christ. Talk all about the coming Messiah. Talk all about that good news. And they do that within the context of their larger forthtelling. Reminding people that, you know, God is good and God is true to His Word and God will bring judgment and God will give graciousness All of these prophets 
were there speaking these true words, and the people could know them. Did it come true? Then that guy speaking the word of God. 350 prophecies concerning Christ, including his death and his burial and his resurrection and how he lived and some of the things that he did, all of that's true? It was certainly the gospel of the prophets. Now, do we have prophets today? No, we don't have people who foretell the future. Now, we all should be willing to foretell. That's what God tells us the word is for, right? As we pick up that word, as we study it, as we come to know it, and as we go, hopefully, to one another and provoke one another unto love and good works and encourage and strengthen one another, doing what the Bible says, reproving, rebuking, exhorting, with all long suffering. Hopefully, we're doing that type of forthtelling, but there are no prophets today. Oh, there are people who pretend that there are prophets. There are people who would like to think that, you know, they are prophets. How many of you remember the, uh, the San Francisco preacher? I think he was 90 years old when he made his the last prediction in 2012. Harold Camping, you remember him? Harold Camping made a prediction that, uh, you know, <clears throat> March 8th, uh, or excuse me, May 21st, in 1988, uh, that, uh, you know, things were all going to come to a close. He did the same thing on May 21st in 2011. That God was closing this chapter of history, that everything was going to come to its final conclusion, that Jesus was going to, to return, and that this was the set time. At least five times this gentleman did that. How many of those times was he right? <laughs> Zero. Zero. What the prophet said very simply was not true. And therefore must be discounted. See, the prophet must be true to the word of God. God still has his called out. God still has his sent out. And God still calls for people to reveal his truth in this day and age. It was for the prophets. It was for the apostles. God gave them the truth. And then he appointed men who would teach men who would teach men to go out into the world and to teach this gospel. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> I want to begin reading at verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort and with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off to myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And that's the advice that Paul gives this young evangelist, Timothy. But it's the same thing that God's been saying ever since the time of those prophets. It's the same plan that God put into place ever since man fell. All the way back in the garden where he provided that, that light, that ray of hope. There in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, there's a plan. And from the seed of the woman, there's going to come this Savior who will crush the adversary, though the adversary will bruise him. All the way back then, he was alluding to that gospel, that good news that the world so desperately needs to hear. So it's from the, or for the apostles and from the apostles. It's from the prophets and for the prophets. But then notice the last thing that Paul says. But notice kind of the, the, the three-point outline that he makes. He hits the first point. He hits the second point, kind of mentioning those things. And they're important. But then notice he gets to this third point about the gospel. And man, he goes on for a few verses about it. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And notice with me beginning at verse 3. <clears throat> 
Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Concerning the Son who was descended from David according to the flesh, and He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'll let you go and reread the rest. See, the gospel was of the, prof- <clears throat> was of the apostles, it was of the, the prophets, but... Oh, man, maybe go back. Ooh, it actually went back. Gotta like it when things work. The gospel is the Son. The prophets taught it. The apostles were sent out to teach it. But the gospel is the Son. The gospel is Jesus Christ. And don't let the nuance be lost on you here. Christ is the embodiment of good news. And that good news can permeate every single facet of your life. When we center our hearts, when we center our minds, when we center our lives around it. Sometimes we can get a little off base on these types of things. And I know sometimes in the, in the, in the practicality of things, as, as we look and we see our own circumstance and we're suffering under the weight of that trial, or maybe find ourselves in those dark places, it's sometimes difficult to remember. Jesus is the answer. And sometimes we, we wonder to ourselves, what does that even mean and how does that help me now? And sometimes that's kind of the point, isn't it? When we contemplate the answer to that question, then I think we're moving in the right direction. See, because sometimes, even though I can ask the question standing here behind this big chunk of wood, that's not going to be the answer you need to hear when you're in that specific circumstance. That's not going to be the encouragement that will strengthen you when you're in your circumstance and you're overcoming and you're fighting your way out. See, that's why you don't ask me. That's why you ask God. I can just simply tell you to do so. And I can tell you there is good news. And that good news is Jesus Christ. Not only is he good news, he is the perfection of what it means to be good news. It wasn't too long ago. I don't know where I read the story. It might have been one of those funny little Reader's Digest stories. You know, if you ever read Reader's Digest, you know, I, I don't know where I was. I think it was a doctor's office somewhere. And I was reading the, you know, that's what they had, Reader's Digest. It, it was either that or, you know, fly fishing Utah or something like that. And I, can't see myself fly fishing Utah, so I picked up the Reader's Digest. And there was this little story in there about this police officer. First day on the job, and they, he goes out, goes out, and he's with his you know, partner riding along who'd been on the force for you know, 15, 20 years. And they pull up to this corner, and these people are congregating there, and that kind of bothered the young rookie policeman. So he rolls up to him, rolls down this window, and says, Look, you, you guys can't gather here. You need to disperse. This is an unlawful assembly. And the people just kind of looked at him and ignored him. So he rolled the window down again, yelled at him this time, using kind of the loudspeaker in his squad car. And the people looked at him funny, but sure enough, they they walked away. He rolled up the window and rolled away and couldn't help but notice his partner's laughter and looked at her and said, well, how was that? And he said, pretty good, except that was a bus stop. See, we don't always get it right. Christ got it right 100% of the time. He gets it right always. He's not just the Savior. He's the perfect Savior. Down to the point where Paul himself in the book of Hebrews says that he is the Savior perfectly fitted for us. See, he came here. He let go of that place in eternity. Now, that's, again, nothing to be trifled with. He was there with the Father in that glory. Gave that up to become the man, Christ Jesus. To serve humanity from that point forward. And he did so. 
knowing what it means to feel pain, knowing what it means to, to struggle. He was tempted in all points like we are, but what? Was without sin? Tempted in, in, in all points. Would you say that Christ had his moments where he was in that, that darkness? I would dare say that the garden scene is that place that I always remember from his life. The anguish that was born there. I mean, I've been in a lot of places that I think that, you know, for me, were, were pretty hard. But I, I, I can say that I never had teardrops that were like blood. I didn't have the foreknowledge of what would come and know that it was going to be horrible. And then feel the pressure to do it anyhow, knowing how much just hinges upon that moment. I don't know whether that would be a blessing or not. But I do know that he overcame. I do know that he won the victory. I do know that that overcoming, because he was the sacrifice perfectly fitting for us, paved a way for us to find our same way out of those same types of places. Whether it is something sinful that people have compelled us in, whether it is something of our own doing, or whether it's just simply experiencing this world in its state of brokenness, Christ is the answer. Because he overcame. Notice what Acts 10 says about it. Acts 10, I just want to read verse 38 for the sake of time. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. And you think about the ministry of Christ. You think about what he did when he was alive. And then you think about that added with what he did for us in his death. And what he did for us in his burial and resurrection. You have this complete and perfect picture of what it means to be a, a, a savior. So when we find ourselves in those moments... We don't know what to do. And we don't know what we should even think. And, and maybe sometimes we don't even know what we, we should feel. You can rely upon your, yourself and you'll probably not get any an different answer than the answer that you've come up with so far. And you can go to other folks and seek their wisdom and that's a great thing to do. And get their encouragement and strengthening. But ultimately, the question is, are you going to the one who's good news for everything in life? Are you going to God? Are you going to his son? Have you allowed the good news truly into your heart and into your life? See, because when you let the good news in, when you let it fully kind of embrace who you are as a person, It will do wonderful and amazing things in your heart and in your life and in your perspective, in the way that you view the things of the world. It is truly an amazing thing. So have we received the good news? Not too long ago, too, I read another story about a young man <clears throat> in his 20s Still living uh, with, you know, mom and dad going to college. When he came home and uh, was cleaning his room one time. As he went through the room, no doubt he found lots of dirty dishes and dirty socks and things of that nature. But he also found these lottery tickets that he bought. Found out that one of them was actually a, a, a winner. Thousands and thousands of dollars. It was interesting. And that's something that most people would get really, really excited about. Man, thousands of dollars. That's pretty cool. And that hidden treasure was right there in the room. How many people have the hidden treasure right there in front of them? Sitting on a shelf, waiting for them to read it. Did 
Do we rejoice over this good news? Because it is truly good news. Jesus is the gospel. Have you come to him today? He's your answer. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? As the song says. Tell it to him. If you're here this morning, you need to begin that relationship with him. Hear his word and believe and repent of your sins. Confess the name of Christ, that he is the son of the living God, that he is the answer. Enter the waters of baptism and let him wash you clean. That doesn't mean all of our struggles and all our trials go, go away. As a matter of fact, in, in many cases, that means sometimes they're, they're going to get worse, but you'll look at them a whole lot different. Maybe you've just lost your heart for it. Maybe somewhere along the way, the simplicity of the gospel has just kind of been bound up in all of the complexities of the world, and you've moved away from it. If you're here this morning, you have need that you desire to make known. If you want the strengthening and encouragement of brothers and sisters in Christ, you want us to pray for you. Whatever your need is, we encourage you to make it known as together we stand and sing.